It's always great to have somebody back again. This is her second visit to Cranbrook in the time that I've been here. So let's get started. Uh, actually, and part of starting is to thank Tricia Holt and Sarah Turner for co-sponsoring this lecture and doing all the labor to help get it to happen. <laughs> yes. All right. Kate Boninsinga was the founding director of the Stanley and Gerald Rubin Center for the Visual Arts at the University of Texas in El Paso, where she curated dozens of exhibitions, which included shows like Liz Cohen uh, and stuff that I was in. Uh, she established an undergraduate minor in museum studies and taught courses in curatorial practice. She's interested in museums as dynamic sites for learning in the impact of art in gallery and non-gallery settings and in the current methods that artists employ to make difference in society and culture. Boninsinga is the author of Curating at the Edge, Artists, Resp artists Respond to the U.S.-Mexico Border, and a chapter in Born of Resistance, edited by Scott Baugh and Victor Sorrell. She curated and authored the exhibition catalog for Stage Stories, 2009 Renwick Craft Biennial, uh, at the Smithsonian Renwick Gallery. Since 2002, she's been a national art peer for the General Services Administration's Art and Architecture Program, and she currently serves as the director of the School of Art and College of Design, Architecture, Art, and Planning. Good Lord. <laughs> Do you have the whole school? <laughs> I mean, you might as well be directing the whole college, Kate. No, I just have the yeah, okay. <laughs> the University of Cincinnati, where she's also an associate professor. Please welcome Kate Boninsinga. Thank you so much, Mark, for that kind introduction. I'm so pleased to be here and to see all of you this evening. Thanks for having me, and thanks to Sarah and Tricia, too, for all the legwork that you invested in my visit. I appreciate it a lot. So um, today I'm going to share with you my observations about contemporary art exhibitions in El Paso, Texas, which was my hometown from 1999 till 2012, and in Cincinnati, Ohio, which is where I grew up until 1980 and where I now reside again. I plan to speak for about 30 to 40 minutes at the most and then open up for Q&A just to give you a time frame. And I'll share examples of galleries and museums in each of these two cities. Some of these institutions exhibit the work of artists who live in the region that they serve, and others exhibit internationally known artists, and some of them do both. In my opinion, this creates a rich dialogue between the artists and the exhibitions, and by sharing these institutions and their missions with you, I hope to support the argument that the art world is increasingly decentralized, and excellence in artistic production and exhibitions is achieved in many locations. In my opinion, it may be even more viable to be a practicing artist and an exhibiting artist in the United States in regional cities than it is in national ones such as New York, Chicago, or Los Angeles. First, a little background. From 2000 to 2004, I was the director of art galleries at the University of Texas at El Paso. And in 2004, those developed into the Stanley and Gerald Rubin Center for the Visual Arts at the University of Texas at El Paso, where, as Mark mentioned, I was the founding director. The building that you see in the bottom right corner here is the Rubin Center, and the mountains in the background are in Mexico. This photograph makes it clear that El Paso is located on the border between the two countries. The city across the border is Juarez, which of late has been infamously violent due to drug trafficking and trade. You've probably heard a little bit about it in the media. El Paso, on the other hand, is one of the safest countries of its, um, safest cities of its size in the country, if not the safest. I hear varying statistics, but it's a very safe place, very little, little violence. Um, so the, the difference between them is excruciatingly clear as far as the sense of fear that Americans feel when they cross the border. Uh, to go to Mexico. At the Rubin Center, I developed a curatorial focus on commissioned art that addressed the border as a site, especially its desert climate, which you see here, which, with a piece called Hydromancy by an uh, artist collective known as Simpark, which refers to simple architecture. And they uh, created 
uh, solar stills in conjunction with an engineer that actually uh, distill the water. They distill dirty water to the point that it becomes drinkable and we pipe that water down the hillside into the galleries and let it drip onto the floor. And people were welcome to take a drink of the water uh, as they were viewing the shimmering reflection of the water on the wall next to it. Um, we also had a sound component where they took field recordings of the various sounds on both sides of the border. So that's an example of one of the pieces we commissioned that really talked about the preciousness of water and the desert environment. And we also commissioned artwork that referred to the tension of the border due to the violence that I just mentioned. And this was a piece by Enrique Yezik, who is an Argentine now living in Mexico City, who actually carved in a performance piece, carved five contested borders in the world, North and South Korea, US, Mexico, Israel, Palestine, or Israel, um, um, I've forgotten the, the country borders. Um, uh, sorry about that. And Colombia, Venezuela. Um, and then he had a video of footage that he mostly downloaded from YouTube of images of that respective border. So this mission, this sort of curatorial focus became the subject of a book that Mark also mentioned called Curating at the Edge, Artists Respond to the US-Mexico Border that will be published by the University of Texas Press in January. So it covers exhibitions that I curated between 2005 and 2012, 2011, excuse me, and really focuses on curatorial decision making, how I as a contemporary cur art curator decided which artists to exhibit and how to support them in my mission to create the most compelling commissioned work I could for the, the Rubin Center. So um, over the past two months, now I've just wrapped up that project this summer, and over the past couple of months, I've really begun to expand my investigation of the regional as global and contemporary art, because El Paso is a very sort of localized place. Not many people, it's not an, a sort of internationally recognized city that tourists go to, so it's, it's got a very local flavor, and yet it's been in the, it's got a, a sort of international concern because of its location right on the border. So I wanted to expand that investigation to really think about other regional cities that don't have that attribute, that national, that national border attribute that El Paso had. And so I've started to think about Cincinnati because it's where I am and thinking about how um, curatorial practice there is shaped by it as a place. So you all as an audience on the, are in the, on the very ground floor of this new investigation on my part. This is the first time I've ever really talked about it in public, and I'll be eager to get your feedback. So um, just an, you know, more of a sort of in background information. In El Paso, I developed a museum studies minor and taught courses about exhibition practice and theory using the Rubin Center as a laboratory for learning. And these are some of the students in the exhibition practices class that I taught during the spring of 2011. I taught this class every semester, and part of its premise was to involve students in the conceptualization, interpretation, and installation of the works of art exhibited. And then a number of these types of classes provided them uh, with the skills required for an entry-level position in a museum or gallery. The exhibition that they are preparing here was called Light Lines by Jay Atherton and Cy Keener. And this exhibit began like hydromancy in the landscape surrounding the building. And you'll notice several triangular mirrors here up in the, in the landscape there. And they reflected light into the gallery. And uh, the next few slides are the uh, exhibition installation and process. And we were creating this sculptural curtain created from impregnated gauze that would manipulate light reflected that was reflected into the building by the mirrors. And the gauze was made of the type um, used for cast to heal broken bones, so it was plaster impregnated, as I mentioned. So this alluded to the break of the border and its hope for repair. We also misted the uh, squares and then sort of crinkled them, which looked a little bit like uh, an aerial view of the, of the surrounding topography. This is Cy Keener. And this is Jay Atherton, his artistic partner. Both of them trained as architects, and both of them are now practicing as artists. And at the time, they both resided in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, I had seen an exhibition of theirs at the Scottsdale Museum of Contemporary Art, which was their very, very first collaborative exhibition. 
So the one at the Rubin Center was their second. So needless to say, their careers were nascent and they were really emerging as artists at the time. And they were regionally known at best. So I was interested in creating an opportunity for regionally known artists such as them, as well as internationally known artists. So this is an example of a more regional uh, exhibition that I curated. The final piece was a, a, a sculptural curtain uh, that manipulated and absorbed the light. And here are a couple of images of the final piece. And I just wanted to share that in the neighboring gallery was another regional artist. It was an exhibition of paintings by Rigoberto Gonzalez, who lives and teaches in a high school in Harlingen, Texas, which is another border town in the eastern part of the state. And he decided to portray life on the US-Mexico border and the struggles there due to the drug trafficking and trade. And he portrayed them in the Bar Italian Baroque style. And the students were responsible for not only interviewing the artists and writing all the wall text, but also designing those texts. So the loose connection between the two exhibitions was the use of light and art. And uh, both artists live in regional cities and were exhibiting in another re regional city. And my goal as a curator and director was to create a level of excellence equal to that of other university galleries and museums or like institutions in national cities. An example of an exhibition by an internationally known artist that I exhibited at the Rubin Center uh, was Regina Silveira, who is based in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And you know, when I was reviewing this presentation last night, I noticed that there was an uh, exploration of light, and the country of Brazil seemed to recur throughout the uh, presentation, and that is coincidental, but it's kind of an interesting theme that I would need to think more about, like why that kept happening. But um, it is indeed true. Um, she's achieved projects, uh, Silvia has achieved projects as institutions such as the National Museum of Art at Reino Sofia in Madrid, and here you see her piece Lumen at the Crystal Palace that is part of the Reino Sofia. And as you probably know, a lumen is a unit of luminous flux, a measure of the total amount of visible light emitted by a source. And luz, that you, the word that you see in the ceiling there and the dome, which is reflected on the ground, means light. Here's another piece that she created for an exhibition space in Poland. And um, it's adhesive vinyl on the floor, which gives it a sense of depth. Uh, it's, uh, the title refers to, is called Abizel, and it refers to the depths of a bed of an ocean, at least 20, the depths at least down to 20,000 feet. So she's interested in not only light, but how light impacts a perception of depth. And then she did another amazing piece called Tramazul in 2010, which uh, was on the exterior of the Museum of Art in Sao Paulo. And here you see it being applied and the final results in the bottom. And this is another piece called Luz, which was at the Foundation Ibere Camargo in Porto Alegre, Brazil in 2011. Again, it says Luz on the exterior of the building and they handed over the entire interior to a, a retrospective exhibition for Regina. Um, but I wanted to share with you the exterior piece. So the Rubin Center commissioned a piece called Gone Wild Reversed in 2012. Is that right? 2011, it was fall of 2011, the same year that she did the piece in Porto Alegre. And um, it was literally a huge decal that represented the oversized tracks of a coyote, which referenced coyote, the people who traffic Mexicans north to the United States, and the desert animal who mobilizes after dark, and we are more likely to see its tracks than the animal itself. The tracks descended from the west wall of the gallery, which is on the side of the building that faces Mexico. And they came together on the other side of the gallery in what Silveira called the locus of attack. Walking around the gallery was a near, nearly hallucinatory experience. It was based on an earlier work she had created called Gone Wild for the MCA in San Diego. And here's a piece, a uh, photograph of the artist in her work. And um, I actually co-curated this with a curator named Monica Ramirez Montagu, who at the time was at the Aldrich Museum of Contemporary Art in Connecticut. And um, we had Regina's work in our space in the fall, and then it moved over to the Aldridge to open in January of the following year, January 2012. But we didn't move the commission piece. That was specifically for that room, so that didn't appear at the Aldridge. They had some other vinyl pieces from previous um, exhibitions in Regina's career. 
But that was a really satisfying and wonderful experience to co-curate with a, a curator at a, a national venue like the Aldrich um, that has very high standards and um, we co-produce a catalog and it was a terrific way to bring this sort of this sort of more regionally known institution and young institution like the Rubin Center to the attention of the mostly New York audience which, because it's a, a short train ride from New York City to get to the Aldrich. So also in El Paso is the El Paso Museum of Art which owns and displays an encyclopedic collection and these are two of its galleries. They also um, regularly show contemporary art and here you see an exhibition in the process of being installed in the museum's first floor gallery by Margarita Cabrera, who's one of El Paso's artists who sustains a national and international career. Um, the Rubin Center and the El Paso Museum of Art depended upon and supported each other for con complementary programming that would develop an art audience there. And it's become a fertile and healthy informal institutional alliance that's been really important to developing art appreciators, uh, art appreciators in the region. But in spite of that really healthy and wonderful atmosphere in El Paso, in August of 2012, I moved to Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, I became the director of the School of Art, as Mark mentioned, that's part of a college of about 2,500 students that's known as Design, Architecture, Art, and Planning, or DAP for short, um, at the University of Cincinnati, which is a large state university of about 42,000 students. Um, whoops went too fast. Um, the commons area of the university is in the upper left here, and DAP, the DAP building, which is, was designed by Peter Eisenman in the early 1990s, is in the lower right. So that's where I go to work every day. The School of Art has 26 full-time faculty, including me, and about as many part-time faculty and serves over 400 students, 50 of whom are graduate students, and it includes fine art, art education, and art history. The University of Cincinnati is known for its undergraduate cooperative education program, which was begun in 1906. And co-op means that students work full time during five semesters and on our campus for eight semesters. So it requires five years, year round, to earn a bachelor's degree. And the students emerge with substantial work experience that gives them an edge in the job market when they graduate. And so here you see the fashion design curriculum, um, seems to have a life of its own, fashion design curriculum for a typical undergraduate fashion design major who's engaged with co-op. I know it's difficult to see, but I just want to give you, this is a very sort of rigorous way to earn a bachelor's, but the significant part of it is that you come out with work experience. And many of the students who co-op at with fashion designers then are employed by them once they graduate. So it's a great way to go. Um, the, the University of Cincinnati's Division of Professional Practices is tasked with developing new employers to engage in co-op and with placing students with those employers. So that takes a big task off of the shoulders of the faculty at DAP. Uh, that particular division is located in the building you see to your right and it's headed up by a vice provost and so it's a, a big operation. These are some of the uh, global companies that our designers, architects, and planners co-op with. Uh, and they range from Los Angeles to London to Cincinnati to Detroit. Uh, the only school in DAP that does not participate in co-op is the School of Art. Why, I asked, uh, artists could apprentice with fine artists, engage in ambitious projects, and, and in need of help. Here, for example, is a model for a public piece created by Cincinnati-based Matt Lynch with his Chicago-based collaborator, Stephen Badgett. It's for a newly expanded border station that is heavily trafficked by trucks in Tornillo, Texas. The cloud-like mass is comprised of rear-view mirrors from 18-wheelers and will be viewed primarily by truck drivers from behind a windshield. Its intention is to play to its location while also transcending it. They were really in need of help to figure all of this out, and that's something that the School of Art students might have been working with. Or they could help with the production of professors like Katie Parker and Guy Michael Davis, who you create as a collaborative team. And in the bottom you see it uh, as it was displayed at the Taft Museum of Art in Cincinnati, which is a Frick-like collection that was established by Anna and Charles Taft, the half-brother of US President William Howard Taft. And now it's an art museum open to the public. Um, I was really interested, I had the great pleasure of going to the Saarinen House today, 
and seen Andrews's interventions there. And this was Katie and Mike's uh, quote unquote intervention in the, the Taft Museum is their piece in the middle. Um, this room itself is usually, uh, if there is ever a place where contemporary art is shown, it's in this little room at the Taft and the rest of it's pretty much um, I'm not going to say locked down, but it's prescribed. Uh, the paintings are just as they were left uh, when Anna and Charles left, <laughs> died. Um, but it was what they did with the Taft was very similar, not similar, but it, same concept of, of contemporary artists intervening into a historic home that I saw uh, today on campus. So, um, there are several other museums and galleries in Cincinnati where our students could co-op. And I'm gonna share with you today six of them in addition to the Taft. One of them is right on campus in the DAP building and it's capably directed by Aaron Cowan and it exhibits student artwork as well as the art of professionals. Its goal is to support the academic curriculum of the four schools in the college. So sometimes you'll see fine art in there, sometimes you'll see planning documents, sometimes you'll see architectural models. Then there's the Weston Art Gallery, which is in the center of downtown. Its director, Dennis Harrington, trained as an artist and his curatorial focus is artists who live in Cincinnati. Here is the Weston's entry area with a suspended piece called Billy Budd by Peter Haberkorn. It was part of a summer 2013 exhibition titled Seeing Opera, where Cincinnati-based artists were invited to create artwork based on the narratives of the operas performed by the Cincinnati Opera that season. Billy Budd is a powerful tale told by Herman Melville in his classic novella of Innocence and Betrayal on the High Seas. The opera is based on the novella and a young sailor's unwitting actions that compel his captain to execute him. Habercorn's suspended sails reference Budd's ship. The exhibition at the Weston prior to seeing opera was American Pacemaker, which was a multi-channel, multi-screen digital film installation by Cincinnati-based Russ Johnson. It addressed the changing landscape and people of the Midwest who had been impacted by economic trends and political policy. His installation structured familiar imagery, which included a distribution warehouse north of Cincinnati, a former machine shop in a now gentrifying neighborhood, and the machine that you see on the left, there was actually a lathe that he took from that former machine shop. Um, the decaying wall of an abandoned factory and a defunct furniture warehouse in a now also gentrifying downtown. These were viewed as looping projections with verbal rhetoric from former employees of each of these establishments. While elements of Johnson's roots as a filmmaker working in traditional form was evident, it was also, this documentary film was also uh, sort of unconventionally and uh, conveyed in a nonlinear form. Across from the Weston is the Rosenthal Center for Contemporary Art. It building, its building represents the first US museum designed by a woman. Uh, who's now internationally known, Zaha Hadid. At 80,000 square feet, it is known as the f physically largest non-collecting art museum in the country, and it was completed in 2003. They are currently exhibiting the work of JR, and I attempted to get um, exhibition shots, but I was unable to procure those. Um, and he was the 2011 winner of the TED Prize, and you can see a photograph of him in the upper left here. Um, he started his career in France, and this image is from his body of work called 28 Millimeters, Portrait of a Generation, from 2004. Uh, and you can see that this guy in a Parisian suburb is, a, a part of Paris is holding a video camera and sort of aiming it at you uh, like it's a gun. Um, he has become known for photographing people, many of whom are economically underprivileged in their own milieu, and then exhibiting those photographs in the neighborhoods where those people reside, often at very large scale and in public places, such as this one in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, from 2008. JR considers, I'm, I'm quoting from his website, he considers the world his studio and his point is to uplift an area by pasting images of its inhabitants on buildings or other public places. And intends to elevate the status of his subjects by placing these large portraits across their own cities. 
Uh, this one was created with his business par partner, Marco, and it's called Face to Face, and uh, some consider it to be the largest illegal photo exhibition ever. Um, uh, he posted huge portraits of Israelis and Palestinians face to face in eight Palestinian and Israeli cities and on both sides of the security fence separation barrier. It was Palestine I was thinking of when I was talking about Yezik's work. So this is uh, another example of what could be considered art on a national border. Another exhibition of, uh, at the Contemporary Arts Center in Cincinnati was by Ernesto Neto, and this is called Dancing Aloud from 2010. Um, and he is an internationally known artist that creates sculptures that express traditional abstract forms but also interacts with the viewer. Uh, viewers are meant to touch, poke, and walk through or on each of these pieces in his installations. And often there's um, fragrances involved too, sometimes emitted from food. And yet, the Contemporary Art Center occasionally shows art from who live, artists who live in our region. And here you see another piece by Katie Parker and Guy Michael Davis, the two artists who work as a collaborative team that I was sharing with you that had their pieces installed at the Taft Museum. And this is their more recent work called The Living Room. And um, they worked in collaboration with yet another artist named Terrence Hammonds, who's a printmaker. Uh, all of them together were artists in residence at Rookwood Pottery in order to make this quote unquote living room. Um, the current owners of Rookwood Pottery purchased the molds and the goodwill of the 19th century Rookwood Art Pottery that was founded in Cincinnati during the arts and crafts movement in the late 19th century and was indeed exhibited at many of the world's fairs including St. Louis and Philadelphia. And the current Rookwood, uh, provided Parker, Davis, and Hammonds with workspace and equipment and with access to the archive of its, its historic molds. The artist upsized and gilded the original tabletop scale bear figurine to be these gold sentinels that you see in front of, of the mantelpiece. And here's a detail of that mantelpiece. Now next to the Contemporary Arts Center is the 21C Hotel and Museum that exhibits a collection amassed by the owners of the hotel, Laura Lee Brown and Steve Wilson, who are capably advised by a curator named Alice Gray Stites. They have an amazing uh, venue there to exhibit. I mean, it's just a remarkable experience. You can walk over there any time of day or night and see really high quality art and you can have a glass of wine in your hand if you want to and you can stay there if you want to and relax in their guest rooms or in some of their more common areas. This is a piece they have by Tam Sailor Wood, it's, uh, excuse me, Sam Taylor Wood, a self-portrait suspended number four from 2004. These are two paintings by Kahinda Wiley. The one on the left is The Prophet and the King from 2006 and the one on the right is Morpheus from 2008. And they also own the work of British-born Nigerian artist Yinko Shonibare, who works across diverse artistic media to explore ideas about African contemporary identity and the legacy of European colonialism in the present. Uh, one interesting thing about him is that he was awarded the, uh, by the British government the, a member, to be a member of Order of the British Empire, which is MBE, and he was awarded that in 2005, which he has a certain ironic twist given the critical focus of his work on colonialism. Um, but he now adds that to his name everywhere he goes. Um, his website, again, states that he has chosen to adopt this title at all times, using it as a platform from which to explore further the colonial legacy, class structure, and social justice issues that remain in the country he calls home. Um, Dutch wax fabric, which is what he's become very well known for and which you see on the um, figurative sculptures here in the two pieces on the right, it began as a canvas for his paintings and then he started using it as a material for sculpture like this. Uh, it's inspired by Indonesian batiks and produced in Europe for the West African market in the 19th and 20th centuries 
and has become to symbolize for him the complex web of economic and racial interactions and interdependencies between Europe, Asia, and Africa. Let's see. There. Okay, another piece. This is um, the one that you see in the upper uh, part of the slide is another piece by Shoni Bare called The Picture of Dorian Gray, which is based on the only published novel by Oscar Wilde also from the late 19th century, like Melville's Billy Budd. Um, it appeared in a magazine in the June, in a, in, it was called the Lippincott's Monthly Magazine in June of, of 1890. And the novel tells of a young man, you maybe you are familiar with this, named Dorian Gray, who decides that the only things worth pursuing in life are beauty and fulfillment of the senses. And realizing that one day his beauty will fade, he expresses a desire to sell his soul to ensure that a painted portrait of him would age rather than him. So his wish is fulfilled, and when he subsequently pursues this life of debauchery and pleasure, the portrait serves as his reminder of the effect each act has upon his soul. With every sin, his image deforms. And there was a black and white film released in 1945 based on, on Oscar Wilde's novella starring Herd Hatfield as Dorian. And in a very pivotal moment in this black and white film, the ever youthful protagonist stands before this portrait that is aging instead of him. And you see in a moment of viv vivid technicolor, this aged portrait. And so it's this shocking moment after you've watched this entire film in black and white. And Shoni Bari does this as well in his uh, still photographs narrating the same story when he encounters a similarly disfigured reflection in a gilded mirror. So it's not, he's not looking at a portrait, but rather at himself. So he's twisting the story a little bit. And you see that in the bottom left corner. Um, so this is just an example of one of the many, many globally known artists that 21C Hotel has and that Cincinnatians have access to on a daily, round-the-clock basis. Also on the scene is the venerable Cincinnati Art Museum, which is on the hill in Mount Adams, and they occasionally show artwork by artists of the region. Um, usually it's not quite as... Um, of, I would say avant-garde is maybe the Contemporary Art Center. So their role is, in my opinion, to, but from what I've seen there the past year is to show more traditionally oriented work like this, um, pa these paintings by Cole Carruthers, who's a classically trained oil painter who is depicting scenes of Cincinnati in that classical tradition. And then um, the same, really the same landscape is difficult to see here, but by an artist named Courtney Cooper, who's actually not a trained artist, uh, and he just takes a ballpoint pen to copier paper and then pieces all that copier paper together uh, based on a knowledge that he's accrued uh, traveling on city buses and walking around downtown. So they paired those two artists. Very different points of view of the same land, same local landscape. And then there is also Carl Solway Gallery that represents artists like Vito Acconci, June Caneco, Saul LeWitt, Thomas Wesselman, Hannah Wilkie, Judy Pfaff, Donald Lipsky, Nam June Pike, and others. Uh, Solway Gallery launched in 1962 and is still in business. And he is probably became best known for facilitating the production of Nam June Pike's sculptures. So a lot of those were cre actually created in Cincinnati. Um, most of Solway's artists are not Cincinnatians, but interestingly enough, many, many of his clients are. So that's really created a fertile territory for collectors to draw upon. 
So between the commercial commitment of Solway, the national reputation of the Contemporary Art Center building, the broad base of historical exhibitions at the Cincinnati Art Museum, the university program and its gallery, and the alternative space at the Westin, as well as the 21C hotels and its world-class collection, the city of Cincinnati, which is, of course, not particularly well known in contemporary art, supports enough institutions to keep most artists stimulated and creates a platform and a context for their own art. Um, and as a side, back to the co-op, any of these institutions could employ our students and, and sort of arm them with experience before they go out into the world. I believe this is also true, but to a lesser extent of El Paso, where there are really only two exhibition spaces of note. Um, and because of that, the Rubin Center is attempting to do the job of three of its counterparts in Cincinnati, the DAP galleries with their focus on education and, and exhibiting student art on occasion, the Westin with this sort of alternative flair, and the Contemporary Art Center, which has more of a national pro profile. Most regional cities that we can think of have their own combination of exhibiting institutions that do the best they can to fill the needs of their population. My point is that if we dig in and launch art spaces, support art spaces, and create lives as artists in such regional cities, those cities will have a better chance of succeeding and prospering, and so will the artists who reside there. Thank you very much.